Another characteristic of mankind that is supposedly unique is the capability to play and thus the possibility to enjoy or conversely to get bored. Yes, the quality of Homo ludens, the being who can have fun, was pointed to as an exclusive condition of a special being. Yet for quite some time now, many scientists, naturalists, and even the majority of modern philosophers are conscious of the fact that other species also enjoy their moments of leisure. In fact, they do so just as we imperiously need play as a way to develop and perfect our abilities, or even as a way to escape and elude the stress of everyday life. It's not hard to find examples. We needn't look much beyond other mammals. We can easily observe how elements found in one's surroundings can be used as tools for provoking pleasure. And how magnificent it is. Now is this surfing or what? Which is all to say, we're not even the only species that knows how to take advantage of a good wave. The fact is, we could look at a lot of things, play, language, the use of tools, etc., and try to prove if we are or aren't just another animal. But in all probability, what we'd find is that other mammals, or fish, or insects, cross over those sacred borders we somehow feel should be impermeable. What almost certainly leads us to hold the firm conviction that we are something more than a savage is that when we visualize man, we imagine him working on Fifth Avenue, pulling the strings behind a complex society that seems to obey almost magically some omnipotent computer. We can't stop thinking of ourselves as a civilized, technological, futuristic being who has taught itself medicine, mathematics, and physics and who has been capable of transforming and destroying the planet almost at will. But let's consider for a moment the other side of humanity. A very numerous side as it happens. One that still values the secrets of more balanced and sustainable life with respect to the environment. This is in no way a defense of the noble savage, but despite the limitations and difficulties that weigh upon these ancestral people, stuck in the past though they may be, the reality is that they still maintain, and honorably so, their primitive links with nature. They are coherent within the scope of their own nature. Let's consider the fact that these people, who wear only the barest of attire, do not needlessly waste or destroy anything. They respect life as if their own lives depended on it. They look wild, an anachronism, and they sustain themselves in an unstable balance. But it is, whatever we may think, the precious cradle of all that we are today. At this point, no one doubts, well, no one who wouldn't want to be considered an animal in the worst sense of the term, that a New Yorker is no more a person than a New Guinea Aborigine. Nevertheless, current society has perverted the perception of this reality, offering us a false appearance of ourselves, precisely due to the fact that we are steeped in a culture that is, at times, so artificial. We might believe that there is an abyss between the behavior of animals and modern human life. But that abyss shrinks to mere nuance if we leave the surroundings of our modern civilization and submerge ourselves in our original habitat. Despite the merely circumstantial differences among the different human cultures on Earth, we are all people, independent from whatever our habitual ecosystem might be. The only thing is that, in this ecosystem, our customs might seem closer to those of the rest of living beings. <laughs> the
The fact is, the sense of distance between man and beast diminishes or grows to a large extent as a function of purely anecdotal aspects. But let's consider another dimension, the fourth dimension, time. It's a fact that a troglodyte more closely resembles a simple primate than a civilized Homo sapiens from the 21st century. Nevertheless, while they might be separated by hundreds of thousands of years, both of these men are Homo sapiens. Or was there a son somewhere with a special lineage whose father was still an animal? And if that was the case, who chose this new being as a mate to perpetuate its genes, a beast? Biologically, we are only an animal. And historically, there could never have existed such a sudden rupture from one generation to the next. It would not be logical to think that a generation of animals had a subsequent generation of people. But whatever our origin, what is certain is that, just like all the other species on Earth, we have been adapting and changing ever since, according to the principles set out by Charles Darwin. And whatever we are now is the fruit of a great evolutionary feat. In fact, human evolution has been real original. Our transformation over time responds more and more to a type of cultural selection, or what's the same, it responds less and less to biological selection. This is to say that, for our species, being tall or strong or attractive is now not as important as being socially well adapted vis-a-vis -vis given moments or places. For this reason, social success, financial well-being or the perception of social adequacy is more important than beauty or physical attractiveness. One's education, academic level, or simply being in tune with the latest fashion might constitute the most important factors in our species' sexual attraction. Each person's cultural components are now what best guarantee one's real possibilities of reproductive success or of one's quality and aspirations in life. Culture, in the widest sense of the word, is the scale by which we choose one another to give continuity to humanity. And our cultural roots are often based on the knowledge that we have gleaned and continue to glean from other living beings. From beings who share our space and who have also shared our history from the moment we first believed that we were not just another kind of monkey.